You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Taste the Mediterranean through March 19th at Whole Foods Market. Save on Animal Welfare Certified Bone-In Beef Short Ribs, Sustainable Wild-Caught Sockeye Salmon, and more. Find sales on Parmigiano-Reggiano, Charcuterie and Ground Lamb. Grab an Olive Bull Bread from the Bakery. Plus, wines from the Mediterranean start at just $8.99. Taste the Mediterranean now at Whole Foods Market. Must be 21 plus. Please drink responsibly. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. Well, hi, howdy. That's weird with my accent. Howdy. Nope, I really shouldn't do accents, or, or to be more precise, uh, poor attempts at accents. Welcome once again to Who Did What Now, the historical comedy pod... Wait, no. The comedic history podcast? All that matters is that you know this is not your history class with me, your host, Katie Charlwood. Uh, it is not suitable for all audiences. It's it's not even PG-13. If you're under 18, just don't. Do some other uh, age-appropriate podcast to fulfill your history needs. Uh, you have, uh, there is no such thing as a fish. I think probably has some good historical bits on it. Then we have the history checks. They're pretty fun. Uh, every other one I can think of, I'm pretty sure, involves cursing. So maybe not. If you haven't guessed already, by the title and episode description, I'm going to cover the twisted history of Coca-Cola. I'm fairly certain I'm not going to get sued. Uh, So, the history of Coca-Cola. It has everything. Drugs, scandal, corporate competition, institutionalised racism, and everyone's favourite villains, Nazis. I mean, not that... Not favourite villains, like not out of, you know, which villains are the best, not people, but you know, you know, if you're going to have a villain in a movie set in the past, you're going to have, you're going to have a Nazi. I mean, the last movie I watched, the last zombie movie I watched, I think they were Nazis. Although, in fairness, if somebody's eating my brains, their their ideology isn't really that fascinating to me, uh, because, you know, they just want to eat me uh, and not in the good way. So let's get ready to rumble. Let's get ready to rumble. Coca-Cola was invented in 1886 by a pharmacist, Dr. John Steth Pemberton. I think it's Steth. Uh, S-T-I-T-H. We can hope. So I've written pharmacist here and then I was looking him up on, like everywhere else it said pharmacist. And then I dared to look at Wikipedia and Wikipedia said biochemist. Because, of course, the the same thing, but okay. Just in case, also biochemist. So, yes, biochemist slash phys... No, not a physicist, pharmacist, Dr. John Stave Pemberton. Eh, back in the olden days, you'd find people like to use as many of their names as possible, you know, lest we confuse them with anyone else. I mean, I don't know how many other uh, Dr. John Pembertons there were. But, um, yeah. Anywho, Dr. John Stath Pemberton was a veteran of the American Civil War. I hear, why did you say American Civil War? Because I live in Ireland, so, um, we had one too. I mean, England had a civil war at one point. And, uh, Spain? Lots of places had civil wars, so I feel the need to clarify. So... Dr. John Stith Pemberton was a veteran of the American Civil War and, uh, by all accounts, a morphine addict. Don't worry, it was the past. Everybody was. He was a soldier of the Confederate Army and he fought in the Battle of Columbus, which is, like, effectively the last battle of the Civil War. 
and Dr. John gets sabred in the chest. And with a lot of chest stabbings, this very nearly killed him. So Dr. John decides to use his pharmaceutical biochemical skills to make a cure for his morphine addiction. The solution? Cocaine! Well, effectively, he was tr- testing things out and trying different remedies from different plants. There he is in his private pharmacy, Pemberton's Eagle and Drug House. The drugs I get, but the fuck I know what the eagle is about. Maybe it's patriotism. So, <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's, he's working on a few things. He's mixing concoctions in his laboratory, one would assume. Uh, one of the things he made was Dr. Tuggles' compound syrup of globe flour. Mmm, sounds, sounds fun. <sighs> so that's one of the options he made. Anyway, it's 1866, so that's a year after the Civil War ends, and he does it. He makes Pemberton's French wine coca. And this was sort of promoted as, I mean, a lot of people know that cocaine was originally in Coca-Cola was one of the main ingredients because it was made from cocaine, the coca plant, and the cola nut. So, Coca-Cola. Ha 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 ha. But before it gets its super fun name, it was promoted as a sort of a tonic or a cure-all. It was an elixir of sorts. And um, allegedly, it was a painkiller, an antidepressant, and of course, an aphrodisiac. I mean, yeah. Stabbed in a jewel, Pemberton's French wine coca. Constipation trouble? Grab a glass of Pemberton's French wine coca. Erectile dysfunction? You guessed it, wine coca. Melancholy, wine coca, it solves everything. As one would expect, you know, something that solves all your problems. It was rather popular. But then, in 1886, the temperance leagues, the Buzz Killingtons of the party, were in full swing, ironically. And Atlanta County prohibited businesses from producing, buying or selling booze. Although church wine's still fine, because, you know, temperance. So this forced Pemberton to turn his magical elixir into a non-alcoholic beverage. Because, yeah, there was booze in it. Uh, there's there's still apparently like a teeny bit of booze in it, but eh, we'll see. So off he goes. He registers the Coca-Cola company with his longtime friend and good buddy, Willis E. Venable. Everyone has super fun names back in the day. Just like, nice and long, bunch of initials in there, just for good luck. Working together, they perfect the closely guarded 7X secret recipe. Uh, They were planning to make it sort of medicinal, but one day in a crazy random happenstance, they accidentally blend the base syrup in with carbonated water, 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 they accidentally blend the base syrup in with carbonated water and boom, refreshing thirst quenching Coca Cola soda was born. And uh, this was sold as a fountain drink. You would drink it from a fountain, you wouldn't buy it in like a bottle or anything like that. Just from a fountain. Super fun. Unfortunately, it wasn't very popular at first, so Pemberton began selling off his shares to his business partners. Because you've got to remember, uh, Pemberton had a crippling and expensive morphine habit. His cure-all couldn't cure it. He wasn't getting enough off of the, the Coca-Cola. It wasn't giving him enough to really kick his morphine addiction, you know? So he died from stomach cancer. Uh, basically bankrupt, in August 1888 at the ripe old age of 57. And what's left of his shares go to his son Charlie, uh, who, fun fact, also a morphine addict, who decides he'd rather have money now, sells off the rest of his shares, 
and died only six years after his dad. Well, that was fucking grim. Fast forward to 1894, and this dude decides he's going to start bottling up Coca-Cola. Um, it basically was a, a different kind of bottle than one we're used to now. It had a rubber stopper with like a wire in it to stop it from like exploding. But uh, proper bottling started in 1899, but it wasn't until 1919 that the bottles that we know and love appeared. Ah, uh, I think they're called skirted bottles. They're, you know, you know what a Coke bottle looks like. I don't need to tell you. So back in 1903, I'm doing this chronologically. I'm doing my best to do this chronologically. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Back in 1903, the bigwigs at uh, Coke decided to make the radical decision to remove the cocaine. If you're thinking it was because of the Pure Food and Drug Act that forced uh, basically foodstuffs to list dangerous and abusive ingredients like cocaine, morphine, opium, alcohol and cannabis on the labels if they were present. Nope, because that didn't happen until 1906. Oh, you ask, was it because cocaine was banned by the US government? Nope, that was 1914. Well, Katie, I hear you ask, was it because they themselves realised this was an addictive, abusive substance that was affecting the health of their clientele and they wanted to remove the harmful product as a magnanimous gesture? <gasps> no, now you're just making a fool of yourself. It was because of racism. See, the thing about Coca-Cola is that it was cheap. Like, real cheap. Like, you could pick it up for a nickel or so. Uh, so in today's mortgage, that would be $1.47, or 1 euro and 34 cents, or 1 pound and 18 pence. Math. So, <laughs> Google. So it was so affordable that anybody could buy it, regardless of race. You see where I'm, you see where I'm going with this? You see Okay, good. So, oh, I'm sitting funny. I'm sitting funny and it's making my voice go weird. So, middle class white people, I mean, are we really surprised? We're worried that, and uh, I'm going to say the quote that I didn't want to, but uh, a, a southern newspaper said, <sighs> it referred to, Negro cocaine fiends. Oh, I fucking hate that phrase. I hate it so much. Effectively, they thought African Americans would get all hopped up on Coca-Cola, get engulfed in a cocaine rage, and become all powerful supervillains, raping white women and other such violent atrocities. Because, you know, there, there's enough Coke and Coca-Cola. There was. There was enough cocaine in Coca-Cola to give you, like, just enough of effects. Like, that was the kind of idea. They ever, everyone thought it was medicinal at the time, so, like, you know, it's... it's The past didn't always have the right idea. So, <sighs> to protect the middle-class white people from the non-existent threat... The powers that be at Coca-Cola bowed down to white pressure and removed the cocaine from the recipe. Yay. I mean, technically that's good in the long run, but still, the reasons for it, not so much. Mm. So in 1916, uh, the US government tried to ban, or tried to remove the caffeine Tried to get Coca-Cola to remove the caffeine from, well, from Coca-Cola, and uh, they lost, clearly. <laughs> like, that worked. Good for you. Now we're going to scooch on over to 1919. And in what I can only describe as an ingenious marketing ploy, 
the original formula, the original formula for Coca-Cola was sealed in a fucking vault. Like, ooh. Because, like, there's, you know, the story of, like, the, the, the only two people know the recipe for Coca-Cola. They have to travel on, one of them has half. The other person has another half. And they have to travel separately and whatnot. Um, I mean, the travelling separately thing is probably true because they don't like to have too many people of a business board die all at once because that's not handy or become incapacitated all at once I should say there's a million and one theories about the the recipe of Coca-Cola the recipe the formula whatever you want to call it the vault is in a permanent Coca-Cola museum in Atlanta I'm not saying I wouldn't go there because I fucking would if I was ever in Atlanta (laughs) I would though I totally go I'm, I'm I'm the worst so, by the 1930s, Coca-Cola had crossed the Atlantic and had, you know, bottling plants and factories all over the shop. So, they had they even had one in Germany. Fun fact, the German branch of Coca-Cola was the official sponsor of the 1936 Olympics. Yeah, those ones. With Hitler. Uh, no, I'm not. I, mean, I can't even fake a year for that. That's, no. So, 1939, World War Two hits. Uh, trade routes are weakened, so you can't get stuff in. And alas, Germany has major trouble importing the syrup from the United States, because effectively the syrup would be made in the in the states and then sent abroad, and then the syrup would be mixed with the carbonated water and whatever other nonsense there was there. You know, supply routes are already sort of shaky getting stuff in. And, you know, you know, the trains are definitely running on time, but the trains are so busy shipping people off to their deaths that they just didn't have space for the syrup, I guess. So uh, the, the company was already having having trouble keeping up with demand. And then... Shit gets real in 1941. Uh, Pearl Harbor happens and the US joins the war. And so because the US is now on the side of the Allies, and because the US is on the side of the Allies, uh, all trade ties with Nazi Germany are just completely cut. So even though they might have been getting a wee bit in before, you know, obviously not as much as their demand they needed, but now they're just completely cut off. Not, Not a fucking hope. So the German branch, completely cut off from headquarters, couldn't make Coca-Cola. They couldn't make Coca-Cola. So the head of the German branch goes, what the fuck am I going to do? So using ingredients that, you know, he actually had available in Germany, uh, taking a a, a sweet little tip from Miss Muffet, uh, he got some whey, which is the byproduct of cheese. And apple fibres, which were the byproduct of cider pressings. Uh, so he, he took lots and lots of leftovers. Just like all the leftovers, all the stuff nobody wanted. He was like, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take your excess crap. And I'm going to put it in a drink. On top of that, lots and lots of sugar. So it was like one of the only things that wasn't really hindered uh, when it came to sugar. They, they were just given all the sugar they wanted. Was it that they utilised like beet sugar and stuff as well, so it wasn't just all the stuff they needed to like import. Uh, and when they had to think of what they were going to call this drink, there was two stories. Um, well, it's either from Fantasiche, 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 Fantasiche. I can't. Oh, my German is not good. Uh, meaning fantastic, whatever, or Fantasie. Meaning fantasy. That one's much easier to say. And um, and it became really popular. So they called it Fanta after either fantas- fantastic or fantasy. Either way, one of those. And it, 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 it was really popular, but it wasn't just used as a soft drink. There was a cookbook released. So a lot of women, let's face it, they were homemakers at the time. A lot of... A lot of women were homemakers at the time and they were using it to... They were adding it to their baking and pastries and cakes and stuff. 
yeah, it was, there, there was a cookbook. Still can't believe there was a cookbook. So not only was the German um, branch cut off from the war, but so was the Dutch one. Uh, because it, so Germany and the Netherlands were both cut off from Coke headquarters. And the Dutch made their own version of Fanta. So he basically gave them the stuff they needed to make it in the Dutch one. So basically, the German branch helped the Dutch branch make Fanta because his Nazi Germany took over the Netherlands, so the Dutch ones were also cut off. So Dutch made their own version of Fanta, but theirs had like elderberries in it. <laughs> you know, Fanta smells of elderberries. So that was fun. Now, yeah, I love that. Like, the Dutch are like, yeah, we will take a drink, but we will also add elderberries. That is not a Dutch accent. And I should know what a Dutch accent is. My sister-in-law's Dutch. Um, so the war is over. Fanta gets discontinued. Oh dear. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. But Coke starts diversifying when it comes to like alternative drinks in the 50s. Like they're really hitting into that sort of the new teenager that created. So they're really hitting into that market. And they're, and they're looking at reaching out um, across the board. And in Italy... The flavour of Fanta, effectively that we know now, the orange flavour, was created. And by 1955, Fanta was created. They just really liked the name, apparently. Ta-da! Which, incidentally, is the same year they invented the Coke can. I mean, Fanta's great and all, but it's, um, it's no club orange. I'll tell you that. So, another fun war story... Regarding Coca-Cola. Well, this one's very much an allegedly one, but it's so good. I wanted to share it. So, allegedly. During Zivo, Marshal Georgi Zukov of the Soviet Union was a mad fan of Coca-Cola. But, it, you know, it's kind of like the biggest symbol of capitalist America, which is... You know, not what they're really looking for when you're in, you're sort of working for a communist regime. Thanks to, so yeah, Marshal Georgi Zukov. So thanks to the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces of future President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Who fucking loves a good can of Coca-Cola. No bottle of Coca-Cola cans hadn't been invented yet. Anyway, he ends up sharing it with Georgi. Georgie fucking loves it. He's like, I need some of this. So he asks... Because he he basically asks for what he calls white coke. Which is different to the other white coke we've heard of. So he basically asked Coca-Cola to make a colourless... A colourless, less American coke and to disguise it. Yeah. And unlabeled, it, it's it's mad. So he wants it unlabeled. He wants it not brown because he doesn't want it to look like Coke even like a little bit. <laughs> oh man, uh, he wants it disguised as vodka, which is the funniest fucking thing. So the commander of Allied Occupied o o Austria, uh, General Mark W. Clark, I fucking love everybody's names, gets the message over to President Truman who then passes it on to the chairman of the board at Coca-Cola. <laughs> so it turns out there was a bottling plant in Austria and they found a chemist who was able to bleach the beverage. So the colourless cola in a straight clear glass with a white cap and a red star made to look like a bottle of vodka was created. Now, all goods entering the Soviet zone were inspected for like weeks, but all the Coca-Cola stuff would just get a free pass and would just zoom right through. And supposedly, Marshal Zukov was able to get his Coke fix while looking like he was drinking straight bottles of vodka like a badass. <laughs> oh man, the 40s were a fun time. You know, for random history facts and not for, you know, the eradication of millions. The like for years, the the way the Coke bottles were made, they were like sub, like companies were like sublet 
the idea, what's the word? Whatever. Like, a one bottling company would hire another bottling company to make the bottles. Like, that sort of way. And Coke bottles had issues for years. And in 1944, they straight, they straight up exploded. Apparently this was a common problem for a while, but nobody really said or did anything about it, I think. They were doing it for a while, but um, Gladys Escola was a waitress and putting away bottles of Coke in a restaurant, and one just, one just spontaneously explodes in her hand. Fucks up her hand. So, so here she is, in the restaurant, putting away the glass bottles, general stock stuff, and one just fucking explodes. Spontaneously. And it fucks up her hand. So she's got a five inch cut, she's got severed nerves, blood vessels, muscles. Uh, so there's a lot of damage there. And if, so she takes them to court. Uh, they admit they're liable. So she is one of the few people to fucking win against Coca-Cola. Like, I love that, like, a woman in the 40s. So the next thing that happened... So the next thing that happened after that was... In 1955, cans of Coke were invented. Hooray! The canning process. Ah. They were probably just trying to figure... Like, I don't know if this was a pre-war situation or a post-war situation where they thought or they thought canning everything was the best idea because they were convinced of a nuclear fallout coming or whether it was just they wanted an easier way to stack maybe anyway 1977 so coke basically is on every single country in the world you can buy it anywhere you can find you can buy it in Burkina Faso you can get it in South Korea. You can get it in uh, Finland, Russia. Anyway, point being, so, but you definitely can get it in two places, which is, uh, which is North Korea, for obvious reasons, and then the and 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 Cuba, because of the trade embargo for like whatever, and whatever. We'll talk about that another day bullshit but we'll talk about it another day my kids are shouting in the background Ooh, professional so where are we now 1977 but then in 1977 so it basically gets banned from india but 16 years later it's allowed to come back but during the interim uh, a, a coke alternative is made called thumbs up and then when coke comes back in it buys thumbs up so basically, thumbs up is like number one in India, and like Coca Cola becomes number two. But there you go. Nineteen eighty-five. Oh yes, Coke decides to switch things up and creates a new Coke, which is what everyone called it. Coke just called it Coke. And um, okay, so there was a fucking uproar. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing. But more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes, even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera but this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. 
However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. They, they wanted to switch things up. They wanted to change the formula. They wanted to make it sweeter. So because of the sip test and the taste test, Pepsi, which Pepsi always won, uh, they decided they needed a sweeter tasting Coke beverage, you know? So they, they changed the formula and they made the new Coke. And there was a fucking uproar. Like, like people were like proper mad, like enraged mad, like angry. Not Ren and Stimpy. I'm sure my age, but not Ren and Stimpy. Fuck. Like, like angry Rick and Morty fans uh, when they find out there's no Szechuan sauce left in a McDonald's. Like, proper angry. So 90 days, 90 days, three months after after Coke is released, the classic, the original Coke formula comes back on. And it's relabeled classic Coke. So you've got Coke, which is the new formula, and classic Coke, which is the old formula. So New Coke eventually discontinues in 2002. And as far as I can remember, I think... I remember an advert where people are just taking a swig of new coke and just spitting it out. Like I think that happened. I'll have to look it up. I, I have a memory of that. But <sighs> speaking of terrible marketing campaigns, in 1990, Coke had the great idea for a campaign. And they poured about a hundred million dollars into it. <laughs> of course. So they planned to give away about four million dollars. And they did this by filling select cans with um like cash and prizes. So that it would be they made these new cans called magic cans. So they were designed like specifically for the campaign. So they were spring loaded and they were supposed to like shoot the prize out. But they were so the bit that didn't have the prize in it uh, was filled with chlorinated water and ammonium sulfate, so that they still had the weight and the proper like weight of a coke, so people couldn't cheat the test. But also, uh, it had the stuff in it so that people wouldn't want to drink it because it would smell bad. A lot of these actually malfunctioned, so that they didn't like eject what they were supposed to, and so some unsuspecting um, winners, we'll say ended up drinking the disgusting water <laughs> and um one kid even ended up in hospital like that's that's how bad it was and um like this stuff smelt really bad like bag like bad egg farts it was so bad the smell was so bad uh that they actually had to end the campaign early they were forced to just like stop like all the prizes hadn't even been won yet. Like, they hadn't been found, but they had to just, like, cut it off because of just... <laughs> just because of how terrible it went. <laughs> oh, man. But, um, more 90s scandal. So, you know, in the 90s, there, you know, we had... We had pogs, tie-dye, boy bands, and fizzy drinks everywhere. And so, what did the totally, absolutely not evil heads of Coca-Cola do when they <laughs> they went for the kids? So basically, the market was oversaturated, and Coke had the same idea that the tobacco companies have, which is hook them as teenagers and hopefully have brand loyalty for life. That's totally what normal people do. So in the mid nineties, these schools entered pouring contracts with Coca Cola. So Coke wanted exclusive rights to sell their products in vending machines and in the cafeteria and schools, and like, just like now, lots of schools have you know tiny budgets, and really needed the money, so you know they sold their souls. It's like a lot of schools got like thirty grand up front. 
and then got a commission for the rights to sell Coke and Coke products for like 10 years. <laughs> In New York, Coke actually gave 90,000 bucks to a school to build a stadium with a fuck off sign, a giant sign of the Coca Cola logo. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, and this seems like, you know, your general corporate shit, you know, but schools were <clears throat> encouraged to sell Coke products and got bonuses, you know, for the more they sold. So, yeah, like a commission basis. And they were informed that if they sold healthier options like fruit juice or milk, uh, they would make less money. And some schools didn't even have... That option, they couldn't even consider it a, a healthy option because Coke actually had to approve what they sold. You know, I'll start with 2000 because that's when it starts. Well, between 2000, it's like between 2000 and 2015, there were a lot of problems with Coke. With Because um, Coke bottling companies, they use a lot of groundwater. So it, Coke has a habit of draining countries of their natural resources, like water. And the quantity and quality of the water just goes to shit. So effectively, there's groundwater depletion. And whenever these factories appeared, it basically it turns into water exploitation. So in a lot of places like South America and India, a lot of, a, a lot of villages would lose their, you know, would lose their, the decent water that they had. And this in turn has led to like loads of protests and, and whatnot, like so much so that, I mean, this has led to loads of protests over the years, so much so that basically a bunch of places have, I know in India they managed to close down a factory, but when it comes to more developing countries, there hasn't, there isn't really an option to fight against Coca-Cola, like it's not really an option. I think they're trying, but you know, yeah. So in 2015, like, India managed to get closed, but I don't know about the others, actually. So 2004, we've gone back in time again. So the water scandal. Da, da, da. So effectively diet drinks, Coca-Cola obviously has a diet range, but the diet drinks weren't really doing so well. So there's like Diet Coke, Diet Coke caffeine free, caffeine free. When does Coke zero appear? Coke with stevia in it. But like even the cook was stealing it, I was like a lot of sugar. But anyway, so I'm like, you know, all of their diet stuff was sort of waning a little bit, and you know those I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them the thirst adverts. Like that's the definition of thirsty. Uh, there used to be a cook a diet cook advert where it would be women in an office. They'd have a diet cook break and they drink a diet cook, and they would watch like a window washer or a, like, or what was it? Or, or fucking builders doing shit. Yeah, because it would just be like gratuitous, like shots of shirtless men <laughs> and women who were working and stroking their necks and that drip of water dripping down the can. <laughs> I just want you to be true and I just want to make love to you oh. <laughs> oh good times like that song I don't even know the full song I literally know like four lines out of the entire song and it's just my diet coke ad that's good advertising and there was nothing really like it at the time I think probably I don't know so oh, the, so the thirsty diet coke ads they just weren't doing what they wanted anymore and didn't really have the same impact so when your diet stuff isn't working, what do you do? You move into the stuff that is selling. Uh, bottled water was like starting to get really big. So effectively, bottled water was just tap water fortified with vitamins and minerals. Like, fuck off, mate. No. <laughs> anyway, this was working great in the US. Fabulous. They go to UK. They broke a deal with a company called Dasani. And their bottled water was, yeah, tap water with a lick, spit and a polish. And the UK told them to fuck off. So, like, it was never really good. People weren't really that keen on it anyway. They were like, um, 
why would I drink it from a bottle when I can get it from my tap for free? <laughs> why? So, in part, but, in what one would call a monumentous fuck up, some of the water was contaminated with carcinogens. So about five weeks after a mediocre debut, they they were gone. They were out. They were just done. There was nothing they could do. Like at that point, like what? Are you Fortified with vitamins and minerals from your tap, and now have some cancer water. Like thanks, but no. Okay. By the time two thousand and six slinks onto the scene, we have. Oh, I can't believe it. We have corporate espionage. It's, I'm not saying, I mean, I'd like to see a movie about it because Coke could just sponsor their own movie. It'd be really fun and interesting. Uh, but have all the characters be played by like really, really ridiculous character actors. But that's just my personal opinion. So fucking corporate espionage. Corporate espionage slinks onto the scene when in 2006, someone along with Two others, uh, what was her name? Williams and the other two, I don't know. But they basically had a pen name of Dark. It's just ridiculous and funny. Dark and Associates claim to be, you know, were disgruntled employees of, of, of the Coke company. And they had stolen vials of product samples and they'd offered to sell trade secrets, product info, recipes, formulas, and whatever was in those vials to PepsiCo for a cool 1.5 million. So they sent them a letter detailing this. And Pepsi did what any big bad corporation would do. They handed all the info over to the police. Everything. <laughs> you know, I mean, for many reasons. And the perpetrators were caught. I mean, well, see, part of it is, like, if they had taken the formula, or whatever, what's the chances that, I mean, if it's corporate espionage, if, if they've stolen them, then that becomes a legal issue and they have to pay, like, damages and whatnot. But if it was, and then you're kind of admitting, but then they'd also be admitting that Coke was better if they had to steal from them. So, I mean, it's like they went, fuck you. We'll talk about Pepsi another day, but whatever. Two thousand and seven. So they're trying to get into the health. So they're trying to get into the healthy market, and they buy a product called uh, vitamin water from Glasso. So in two thousand and nine, <laughs> so people are looking for like healthier options. They're looking for the healthier options, and Coke has vitamin water, and people were looking for it. And I, I was one of them. Uh, I used to drink it in college, I think. Like I, I don't I don't really do diet beverages in general because for me they don't really make sense. I don't need to fill myself with artificial sweeteners. Uh I'll have the full fat one, thanks. Like it's handy if you're a diabetic or you've got a health issue and you can't have A, B, or C. But like if you're just drinking Diet Coke to lose weight, it no. Just have water. Have dilutant juice. It's just as delicious. Have a cordial. Or maybe you just really like the taste of Coke, even though Diet Coke does not taste like Coke. It doesn't even taste the same. Like, if it tasted the same, like, maybe. Diet Coke is what I imagine. If the replicators in Star Trek tried to make Coca-Cola, I think they would come up with Diet Coke or Diet Coke Stevia or Diet Coke... What's the other one? Caffeine Free or Coke Zero. Or one of the ones that just... Because I think Coke Zero and Diet Coke taste basically the same. Which is why they're always adding flavours to them, but like, whatever. Oh my god, what if Coke with, with vanilla is just new Coke and none of us have realised it? <laughs> I'm just, shit. It could be. Anyway, back to the vitamin water. It's got a electrolytes. I'm, I'm not sorry, I'm not even going to pretend to be sorry over that one. The Coke company has to claim that this was the healthy choice. So they're claiming, you know, this is a healthy choice. You know, it's like water, but with vitamins. And a range of delicious fruity flavours. 
And so they were saying stuff like, like it was formulated to provide nutrients that could reduce the risk of eye disease. You know, so like they would say like this berry flavour was formulated with this to help stop this and help with this to help stop that. And um, clearly that is not the case because <laughs> that's, that's not how, that's not how things work. Yeah, big lawsuit followed by them having to label like artificial sweeteners and stuff on it because they weren't doing that before. They were just kind of like, no, no, this is vitamin water with goji berry or whatever the fuck pretend superfood they said they was in at this time. And finally, the last thing, the last thing about Coca-Cola we're going to talk about is pollution. So plastic pollution is a big thing and we got rid of plastic straws even though they are necessary for disabled people so David Antman shut your mouth and companies like Coke the Coca-Cola company was I think the biggest producer of plastic waste in 2019 as far as I remember so that's where we're at we're now at 2019 so 2019 Coke announces that it produces something like 3 million tonnes of of waste a year, of plastic waste, and then it's it's like the main contributor to, you know, plastic waste. So even though it's got these options for, you know, you can recycle the plastic and whatnot, a lot of it is too little too late. They're not really doing anything to do with the original cause of of the plastic like there are some countries that have options where you can go in and you can recycle your plastic bottles and you get like a discount voucher for shops and stuff because you so like i know in sweden you can go in and recycle your plastic bottles in like a shopping mall and you go in and you put in your bottles and it gives you like a voucher for that you can just spend in the shopping mall on in, in any of the stores in there so like that's something that exists, but like it doesn't, I haven't seen it anywhere else. And I just think it would be, like something like that even would just make a difference. Because people like to think they're gaining something, especially people who don't like to recycle. But although putting all the onus on us, the consumers, is kind of shitty when really they should be the one being a bit more careful. But that's neither here nor there. So yeah, that's the twisted history of Coca-Cola. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. I can't really say anything. I'm a I'm a Dr Pepper fan myself. Although I probably need to go and have a look and make sure <laughs> that they're not terrible, terrible, terrible people. I like Dr Pepper. It's my favorite. It's my favorite cola based beverage. No, I don't care who knows it. <laughs> Fucking love Dr Pepper. I mean, say what you want about Coke, they're damn good marketing team. But anyway, yeah, you know what I'm gonna do. So <laughs> what I think is really funny is the the fact that. That depending on how you drink it, Coke tastes different. It's the same, but different. Like a Coca-Cola in a plastic bottle isn't as nice as Coca-Cola in a can. And Coca-Cola in a can isn't as nice as Coca-Cola in a glass bottle. Like that's the hierarchy. Like top tier, you get Coca-Cola bottle. Middle tier is the can. And then bottom tier is, is a plastic bottle. I mean, and then and then after that, like I don't know, oh... But is draft worse? It all depends on whether they water down the draft. Because, like, I've found that in a lot of places, they water down the draft. And so it's just not as nice. But, like, if it does come in draft, it has to be, like, oh, no, no, ice is definitely better than a glass bottle. Hi, sweetie. Hi. What story do you want? You have to go get your story. I'm going to come into your room. Oh, look at that last night. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You can talk to me my time. You want? No, it's okay, baby. Mommy. Yeah? What that? That's a microphone. What the microphone's doing? It's recording what we say. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Do you want to say hello? Yeah. 
Hello. Hi. You gonna say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Say good night. What's your favourite drink? Orange juice. Orange juice. That's right. That's my girl. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna say we're gonna say goodbye, and then we're gonna do our night. We're gonna do our bedtime story. Okay. I want to we can talk when it's night time. I know we can talk when it's night time, but are you gonna get out of my bed? I want to sleep with you. Yeah. Oh, you want to sleep in my bed? Mm, all right, all right. But you gotta go find. You gotta go find a a bedtime story. Okay. Okay. Say bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> you're not talking to I will. I will. I will. Okay. Yeah. So the. Go get, go back a story. Okay. Okay, you go get your story from downstairs. So, yeah. Well, but is draft coke better than? See, here, oh my god, is draft coke better than canned coke? Oh, oh wow, oh. You know what? I'm gonna set up a taste test one day. I'm gonna try this. Because I have to test it now. Because now I don't know. But we're talking generic Coke. We're not talking flavours. We're talking regular Coke. But oh, oh okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>